All right, today we're gonna do something a little different. Um, if you're interested in building bows, it's go. All right, let's start over. Itchy nose. All right, today we're gonna do something a little different. Uh, if you're interested in building bows and, and you have a form, that's pretty easy. But at some point, you decide, you know, you want to actually maybe build your own bow, your own design and things. And that being the case, then uh, I'm gonna show you a couple things about designing and building your own bow today and making your own form. All right, because the method for making a good form is not difficult, it's pretty easy. Uh, it can be done with a jigsaw and a router. All right, a uh, bandsaw is better, but uh, if you got a, don't have a bandsaw, there's nothing wrong with buying yourself a, a good porter cable jigsaw or something like that. You'll use it for a thousand other things as well and uh, you can build your bow form. So what I'm gonna do is, when you design a bow, you have to decide a few things. Is it gonna be a recurve, uh, or is it gonna be a long bow, or a semi-recurve? Uh, there are a number of things available that you can do. Uh, I build mostly full recurves because they're faster and smoother shooting. Uh, the, the longer the bow, the smoother the shooting is in a recurve, and the shorter the bow, the more shock or thump as it hit when the string hits the end of the line and sends the arrow more thump that it gets it's not quite as smooth uh, but short bows have their place if you're shooting out of a blind or out of a tree stand or whatever a short bow is kind of nice um, so like right now what i've done is the original dick green nimrod bow which i shot in my youth and ultimately broke and we couldn't replace it because when Dad inherited the Dick Green business or bought it. I don't know if he bought it or what, but the Nimrod bow form was in fact loaned out and was supposed to come back and never did. Uh, I know what the bow was like. I know the design of it and all that. So what I'm endeavoring to do uh, is to rebuild the short Nimrod bow. And it was a pretty cool little bow. Um, since I couldn't get one, I had bought myself a Red Wing Hunter bow and hunted with it until it broke, which was probably about three years, consider how much shooting and everything we did with it. Uh, it was a great little bow. Uh, so I'm working on designing a bow, a little 52 inch bow, that would be good out of a tree stand, it's light to carry, uh, and it's just a short shooter. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying it's going to be any better. It won't probably shoot as well as my 64 inch bow form, which is, as far as I'm concerned, is the classic bow. It's the smoothest shooting with the greatest amount of power and speed. Uh, it is the happy spot in recurved bows. Now you can build just a straight limb bow, a long bow, pull them back, put a string on it, shoot arrows out of it. Uh, they started putting a little bit of casual recurve into them so when they're strung they look like a long bow but they actually give a little more power because there's the slight recurve in them. Uh, and Anyway, so generally speaking, 66 inches in length, which are great shooting bows, the center line will run right through the middle of the bow, all right? I will show you that. This is the standard 64 inch bow. Now, the amount of deflex coming down and the recurve here, the center line runs right through the middle. So there's kind of an equal amount of deflex and reflex because it deflex runs from here to here and once the curve starts coming up that's the ref reflex or and then it ultimately it's called a recurve because of the curve in the limbs all right so that's a standard 64 now if you want to go to a shorter bow you need a greater degree of deflex in the limb and a, a more subtle recurve because it's short you pull it back it's got to have a lot more flex in it for because you're still drawing 30 inches and a lot of limb movement in a short space on a longer bow, those limbs don't come back as much. So you can have a sharper recurve uh, to store the energy. So I'm gonna get a shorter bow to show you. This one here is a short bow, and you can see in the limbs that the amount of curve there is, a lot of deflex coming down, and a real slow, subtle, recurve. The shorter the bow, the greater the deflex, 
and the greater the recurve that shows it real well there so we're building a farm not off this particular bow or anything uh, it's not copacetic to copy somebody else's bow so you just build your own design alter it any way you want add a little deflex put a little more reflex in whatever you want this bow is a dog of a shooter it has dual parallel laminations two inch wide limbs and they slam down real hard just just jolt the double out of your left arm when you shoot an arrow the one i'm building we're going to make it one and three quarters wide greater deflex a similar recurve because that's essential but instead of parallels because that makes it stack worse parallel lamination short limbs it's also harder to pull back when you get to the end of the full draw so we're going to put basically dual taper laminations in it and fade outs and stuff one and three quarter wide narrower limbs so it's a smoother shooting bow it'll also shoot faster because of the fade outs and because it's a narrow limb with less drag so what you have to do is you start out with some brown paper and you can draw one limb all right so to show you I've taken this paper and I did not draw this in as a half and fold it over I fold it in half to show you so if I can get this this is the form the bow is going to go into this form and be glued and pressed into this form and of course then it will be done so what you do you can draw one half and then fold it over and draw the other half however something you have to keep in mind is in fact that the lower limb is slightly stronger than the upper limb that's accomplished in one of two ways and it doesn't matter how they ultimately will shoot smooth either way you can move the one limb of the lower limb a little further forward so when it's strung because the center is not in the center when you string it you want the limbs to look even all right so by moving the one limb forward a bit it'll have more power in it when you pull it and string it up and it'll look and the other method of course is on the lower limb instead of putting two ninety thousandths tapers you could do a ninety thousandths and a 95 thousandths taper in the lower limb and two 90s in the top and that gives you a little extra strength in the lower part of the limb uh, it's amazing what you can do and get away with in building bows it's, there's a high degree of flexibility you're going to go and you cut out your shape you can see this has been made not a fair deflex comes up in the handle now you notice it's a little bit flat right in here uh, when I went to the drum sander later, I took this hump out. I didn't like that, so I just took that out on the sander and made them equal and made a smoother transition in here. So you might have to make a couple different silhouettes until you get one you like. Now this particular bow will have about three inches above the form, and then after the bow is made, it'll have a riser block put on the back of the handle to complete the handle on the window. To make it look nice and of course you'll see that later so this is your paper pattern that you're going to do and you can see i have green tape on here all right and that was to tape it down on a piece of plywood now what you're going to do is you're going to get good one side three quarter inch fur plywood and uh, you're going to make a form from that all right let's pause this for a minute something i wanted to point out is that i marked the curve here and i put inch marks on it here so i actually this is a 52 but i could make a 53 54 and even a 48 inch bow off of this form then what i also did since i made a difference in my limbs uh, my lower limb is slightly stronger i have marked upper and this one is the lower i didn't write it on it you only need to mark one obviously so that when i make the bow form i'll remember which is which so what i have here is i have an 11 and a half inch piece of fur plywood like i was talking about and i have taped my template on here now i left room at the top and you have to leave room at the sides here so when you glue it together you're going to have holes in here and things 
and you you don't want this being so narrow it warps or winds so having a little extra length on the ends now i would have made this even another two inches longer but as it turned out i just happened to have this particular pieces of fir plywood in the shelf so i'm using them and i'm probably only going to make one or two bows off this form anyway if i was going to plan on using this over a longer period of time you know i'd give myself from the edge of where the limb is hit out here i'd give myself six inches we want the bow form to be one and three quarters you might want to make a two inch wide one and depends on what you want to do i'm making one and three quarters i can always later add a quarter inch onto it if i think the bow needs to be two inches wide you would think you just mark them cut them all in a bandsaw and put them together and then sand it well actually if you have a background in woodwork there's a much easier way to do it it's important that everything is kept straight in 90 degrees or the limbs will be crooked and it will not be easy to tiller and it probably won't shoot so good or you might just give up because you can't get the limbs tillered properly okay. so i'm going to show you an amazing way to do it to have perfect 90 degree form in here all right so what i do is i have this taped in and i'm going to go and i'm going to band saw this curve out all right and as i said you can use a jigsaw depending on what kind of tools you have available to you what we do after that is a whole nother story so let's get this band sawed out and go from there you can see that i have now i've band sawed this out pretty easy job and remember the bumps in the middle see how i've made that a nice even slope i smoothed out the design of it exactly how i wanted and i've made it and i have enough space on the ends here steel pins can be put in here all right that's as simple as that so we've cut it out on the bandsaw the next step we're only working on one level of plywood now remember this is going to be three pieces of plywood thick eventually but we're only working on the one right now because this fundamentally is a template all right now what we do now is we're going to take it over and we go over here to the drum sander all right now you can get various drum sanders from all kinds of places you can go to lowe's and get one for like 129 dollars uh, this is a grizzly model and, and i like it a lot it's got a larger platen it's a steel platen it's heavy it doesn't want to move or anything it's got a four and a half inch drum tall uh were i to do it over i'd probably buy the 500 dollar one with the big square table all right though this is totally adequate for what we're doing and all we're going to do is we're going to go into the drum sander and we're going to sand those curves perfectly smooth and knock all the bumps and grinds out of them so you ha you have a smooth surface uh, you use your fingers to check it out as you go for bumps and valleys since i have such a small shop i've built this on a platform with wheels shelving space and to have it at a comfortable height so i can work right here at just about if my arms are down this is just about at the level of my elbow you see it's just a hair bit higher just makes it a lot easier don't have it up real high you want it down lower where you can see it could be even lower yet if i were to do this over again i'd make the plate here about 35 inches tall okay we got the drum sander here it's actually it's got a dust collector in the back and this process is really kind of dusty so i have a vacuum i just take and put the vacuum in the back and run it now i have done most of the drum sanding already and i'm just going to show you a couple small things you, you have your bow form right here it is important that you keep it flush to the table all the time you run your fingers on the edge and feel for bumps there's a slight bump right there just a little one so what i'm going to do is start this up i feel where the bump is now it's small so i'm just going to touch it and barely go back and forth and if you stay too long in one spot you'll make valleys in it there's a couple little bumps right there so i'm going to come over here find them again and if you did a good job taping your template down your paper pattern down and drawing your line real carefully you can see where you are by just taking down to your line of course sometimes your line isn't perfect 
and you have to take a little bit down because the line's not right. So you just stay at that until you get it to where it's really smooth. Now I got a little bumps and grinds right here. I can feel them in the, in the little recurve. Pretty important. So I would take this out, flip it over. Since the board is parallel, you could do this. If it wasn't parallel, you couldn't because it wouldn't stay square. Done. All right, so you just stay at the sander. You know, cut outside of your line. Leave your line. That way you can drum sand down to it. And get yourself, get, get one of these sanders. You don't have to do it. You can use this. If you have a drill press, I used these for years. It's a three inch drum. Come on, focus camera. It's a three inch drum that goes into a drill press. You bring the platen up to here and then just do it on a drill press. The problem is, is these don't run perfectly true. They vibrate and stuff. You can do the job and all that, but they will not in fact do as good a job as one of these. You know, don't buy a few sixers of beer until after you have this. Then go get them. <laughs> Anyhow, so now this is an important part. So what you're going to do now is we're actually going to use this to make the, the rest of the form. We have made this piece. You've gone to the drum sander. You've got this piece all made. It all looks really nice. It's going to make a nice bow. And so where do we go? Now, what I'm actually going to be doing is I'm making like four or five of these forms for like we started this deaf bow building project up in Saskatoon. I go up every now and then for a couple few days and I help the deaf people build bows. So I'm building this. We'll make four or five forms for them so they can build them too. And uh, the piece that you've cut out of here, don't throw it out. This piece here that you cut out. You want to save that because ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to trim this down and use this to make, if you were to call this a B form for the bow form, this is an A form and we're going to make this so we can make a pneumatic press so you don't have to wrap with elastics. The only problem with that is, is your bow handles have to be the same shape every single time. I'm personally not fond of that, so I tend to wrap my bows. But for this particular bow, we're going to make it with a bow form because there's not a lot of creativity because the handle is so small. Uh, there's not a lot of creativity with that particular riser. So we're going to make it with a, a press. So we'll be showing that a bit too. So where do we go now is we take our template and we're going to lay this out. Now it's marked upper limb, lower limb, and center. Because when you put these together, you need to know this. So, because no matter how good you are, they are going to be slightly different, upper and lower limbs. And mine's different because I made the bottom limb slightly in a stronger position. All right, as opposed to changing lamination or you can, another thing to do is the bottom limb can be wider than the top limb or vice versa, it depends. There's a lot of variability. I think the creativity in actually making a bow that can shoot an arrow, I mean, there's a huge amount of variability you can get away with or be creative with. Let's say it in a more positive light. All right. So what we're going to do is we just trace these. We're going to go to the bandsaw and cut, leaving about probably between a sixteenth of an eighth of an inch outside the line showing. So we'll make them with the template. We're going to cut them and leave the mark. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the process that we're going to use to make these forms absolutely perfect. When they go together, the whole bowl form will match this perfectly. Everything will be perfectly 90 degrees. And when you're done, just a little bit of going over with a little bit of sandpaper to clean the edges, the fuzzy edges off and they're ready to glue and bed. So that's really kind of cool. And it is easy. But the way I built my first bow form is I glued everything together and then I bandsawed the whole bow form and it was a 66 inch bow form and it was in fact two inches thick. It's only what I had so I had to actually go and put bevels on the form 
where the bow settled on top of it wasn't the best bow form. But the real difficulty was bandsawing it because it's going to want to tip. It's very heavy. It's long. You, I have a large table on my bandsaw. It's 23 by 17, and most bandsaws are little 14 by 14 tables. So very difficult on a small bandsaw. And then I went to my drill press with that drum sander and I sanded it. Well, I'm here to tell you, it did not make a bow form as good as it could be. Of course, you know, teaching woodwork for 28 years and doing all kinds of things and building bows, I kind of learned some better ways of doing things. So I'm going to show you that so you don't go through the ignorant bow form building that I did. Okay, so I've got the router here. This is a Bosch. It's a great plunger. It comes with a stationary uh, case as a plunge router case too. The plunge router is nice because you can move it up and down. Uh, it's high on my list of priorities in a router is it's a plunge router. It's got above adjustments, all kinds of things. Of course, you can go to any router you want. It does not have to be, this is a fairly expensive router. You can go and buy a rigid for like $129, all right? and it'll save you huge. You'll use it all kinds of ways in the future. All right, so the nice thing is, is that you bought, this is a router bit kit that you get for, I bought this from Grizzly. I kind of like their products for the most part. They're reasonably priced in Bellingham, Washington. Not far from Russell, actually. Go visit Russell and always go to the tool store. Anyhow, so it comes with these bits and they come with bearings on them and like this one here you see there is a bearing on the bottom see that bearing turns and it's right flush with the cutter now what that does for you is when we screw the template down onto the laminated plywood for the form we've cut all of them out three pieces two three quarters and a quarter with the quarter in the middle and if they're bowed you have the bows face in the middle so when it pulls together it stays straight and when we get to that point I'll show you that to remind you again at that point we screw the template down they've already been bandsawed within an eighth of an inch of there so what we do is we put this in the router we go down onto the template and then we go in with the router and just stay up against the template and follow the template around and it cuts a perfect edge this deep. All right? Pretty awesome. Now, uh, this kit, now once you've done that, you go back with the one with the bearing on the top. All right? You see the bearing is up on the top. You flip the board over, the form, take your template off. You flip it over, lay this down, now you cut in and this bearing goes against the part that was already cut and you go down the form and back and now you have a perfect 90 degree form that you didn't even have to bandsaw and sand and sand and sand. It's just perfect. No dips and dives. It's really good. Now, uh, what I did too is I broke down and, and I bought this bit here. This bit is from Whiteside Machinery. And it is a two and a quarter inch bit with a bearing on the top and a bearing on the bottom. And the nice thing is, is it can be used either way. You can take the bearing off the top and use it with just the bearing at the bottom. Or you put the bearing on the top and flip it over and run the bearing against the template on the bottom and cut through and it'll be fine. Now this bit, well I actually started hunting for a longer bit. And I was ready to have white side machinery. They make custom bits. And, and I want it for other reasons than making bow forms. But this is a perfect tool for building bow forms. If you're going to build more than one. Or if you're going to do creative laminations in your handles. This is a super valuable bit. And this one they had on hand. And it was in fact available for $42. I think I spent about that for that set of three. The set of three is worth it, don't get me wrong. And I built a whole batch of bow forms that are up in Saskatoon now with those bits, and they make just dandy bows. We've built seven or eight bows off those forms already, and they come out beautifully. This is a little extravagant. It saves you making more than one pass. You can 
We can put the template on the bottom. This is up against the template right there. The router bit comes up against the template and just follows it and cuts the form pretty much all in just one pass. So this one will make the job a lot easier. Whiteside USA, it's uh, number 2580. Uh, awesome tool. Ultimately, I wanted to get this in a compression bit for doing other things. The compression bit to have made this size is like 200 and some bucks. This one has a helical cut on it, so it'll cut pretty darn smooth as these grizzly ones, which aren't bad bits, they have perfectly straight cuts. So consequently, they won't be quite as good as the one with the slight helical cut on it. Sloped or whatever you want to say. There are helical cutters, but they don't come with bearings. To recap, we're going to lay out these pieces of wood. We're going to cut them on the bandsaw. Then we're going to assemble them. We're going to take and glue them together and screw them together with deck screws. Uh, just zip, zip, zip and pull the wood together. No clamps necessary. It's all fast and efficient. And then lastly, we go and we place the template on the pieces exactly how we want it. And it's really important to remember to mark the centers on the board and the upper and lower limbs on your form. That's a lot of physical work. Well, I'll do most of like the band sewing and stuff. There's no sense you filming watching a person bandsaw. There's nothing to it. You just pass it through and stay off the line. Go slow and easy. Keep your fingers out of the blade and use your dust collector on if you got it and if not wear a respirator. Probably good to wear one even if you have a dust collector. So much for building the forms today and then we're going to glue it together, put it in and run the router and uh, and end up form. Then I'll show you how to bed it and I'll explain what kind of materials to bed the form with. Some people don't put anything on their forms at all uh, and I'm not really uh, opposed to that but putting a really thin strong bedding material on the bottom will help when you all everything is compressed together it accounts for any nuances that you have uh, that are imperfections I mean simple as that some of these things turn up later and they're a curse um, you find out there is a little dip in your bow form and because of it the glue doesn't press tight in there and guess where the bow is ultimately going to break from too much tension and compression alright that's the spot so by putting a small bedding part in and I can show you what it is right here you can see this green tape it looks like tape alright and if you look at the edge of it I can't focus that close this is about a sixteenth thick and it has five laminations of hard rubber on it five laminations in that sixteenth of an inch this is what we glue onto the form so when the riser comes down and your riser has been sanded to fit and everything if you didn't do an absolutely perfect job by putting enough force on it and pressing it down high places will compress into here slightly and low stasis will stay up so you get a more even glue across a uh, templated sanded riser handle as opposed to a flat handle. Now if you go to a company like Bingham who sells kits and plans and all this kind of thing then um, they make all the, their bow designs with then the dip in the whims. Well the problem is is that uh, that puts all the force right on the feathering of where the handle ends and it may not be a problem on some bows and other bows a little more dramatic in power and things then yes that could be a problem there's a reason they're putting a real like when I did this template here I used a real subtle form originally you saw there was a bit of a hill there and I thought in the, no that's not good you want that coming smooth so I took that hill out and made a really nice smooth arc and and I do it by eye and when you're done with the sanding what you do is you look down the form this way all right tilt it slightly and look at it and you can look at the edges of your arcs and you can see if you have any bumps or grind the human eye is an incredibly accurate tool 
and learn to use it. I mean, you plus or minus a couple thousandths of an inch for certain. All right, I know that for sure. And I used to drive some of my students crazy because I'd look and I'd tell them, you look, you're like a 16th off dimension. They, and they'd measure it and say no way and they'd measure it and realize they were but you get used to looking at things and looking at the lines and the corners and stuff and you can just see every nuance in a heartbeat these are actually pretty darn good I'm really kind of pleased with this particular template and the nice thing is is when I route the form it will in fact be exactly the same every bump that you don't take out of your form this little bearing on the router is going to follow that bump in and out so that bump is going to be transferred to the form now in the ancient past when people built forms and didn't really uh, have this technology or know about how to do it or whatever uh, what I noticed and my dad did some of this was he went where he had dips and grinds he, he went and uh, got Bondo fiberglass for doing auto body work and he took a thing and he spread it in where that bump is let it dry and then re-sanded it to replace the bump and in those days the bows were bedded with cork and do not bed with cork that is a bad plan I have a bow that's fundamentally ruined up here because when I couldn't find this stuff oh I forgot to say what this is um, I bet it with cork like the old days and my cork wasn't as hard as the old day cork it was much softer and when I clamped it in the bow limb clamped and pressed the cork down on one side which meant the limb was crooked you can't build a bow when you start with a crooked limb alright so anyhow this is the cover that you put on art tables or drafting tables so if you go online and you can buy one little sheet like 16 by 20 or whatever and uh, and just cut your one and three quarter inch strips off with a good pair of shears and contact cement them down and then after you're done with that you're going to cover and make sure everything stays down with tuck tape so no glue gets to your bedding material alright so that's you just go online and find that and uh, maybe at the end of this DVD I'll make a list and list up all my sources of things where people can go to find stuff if they want it um, Old Master Crafters and Bingham Archery Products are two that still you can get glasses it's gotten really expensive I at least as far as I'm concerned um, you know anyhow uh, glasses probably 20 bucks a strip now or something like that and back in the early 90s and back past there they were it was like four dollars so times change all right so we're going to take a break from this until I bands all these other forms out we got work to do and then when I get to the point we're going to glue it and screw together you actually don't even have to glue the wood um, I do I don't want any moisture or anything causing the wood to move uh, a bow form once it's been done you know if you just wiped it all down with oil and let it dry put it on the shelf it'd be good for years some of these bow forms I have are from the 1940s all right that's like 60 75 years old and I'm still building bows on them all right so that's all folks All right, we're done band sawing, and I have all three pieces cut out here. A one quarter and three quarter, two three quarter inch sheets. Now, one thing you have to remember is that if you buy Baltic birch plywood or something like that, that's a higher quality plywood than this, that in fact it doesn't come three quarters, three quarters, and one quarter. It comes like 11 sixteenths, 11 sixteenths, and you won't have enough dimension. Then you'll have to laminate another one afterwards and bevel one edge with a router or something to get it down to the actual dimension. So, what we first want to do is make sure that when we put these together, like there's a gap, they're both slightly bowed. So, what we have to do is position these pieces of wood so the bow is in the middle. So, we're going to double check it here. 
Yeah, you see that there's a gap out in the tail here and a gap here. They're touching in the middle. So this is going to go on this side here. And the quarter inch piece is going to go in the middle. When you get them together, you should be able to line them all up, put a clamp in the center, squeeze it up, and it should be fairly tight all the way down. There's a bit of a gap here, but when we deck screw it together, it'll all pull down, and it'll be actually quite straight. Straighter than I could shoot an arrow. So, so what we have to do now is we have to glue and deck screw this all together. We're going to put this form together. I grab my handy dandy uh, battery powered drill had a bunch of inch and a half and inch and three quarter deck screws. Now you're going to screw from both sides so inch and a half will do. If, if you use inch and three quarters they're buried just enough that the points will stick out the other side then you have to grind them down. So you're going to run an inch and a half all down one side, flip it over and run inch and a half in the other side to pull it all together tight. But we are going to in fact do a little bit of gluing first and it's kind of important to make sure your wood is fairly clean. Make sure your surface is clean. This stuff has been outside so it looks dirty when it's actually not. And uh, I use just yellow, you know, carpenter's glue. That's all you need for this. You know epoxies or nothing. It's not going to be outdoors where it needs to uh, um, have a special wood for exterior grade stuff. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to pour glue down here. i got a little bit of lamination, thin lamination wood, and I'm just going to squeeze it on. You don't have to have it all covered. The screws are going to hold it, but, you know, get it glued nicely. Both surfaces, thin amount on both surfaces, put it together, flip it over, do all the surfaces. And it is important when you do this that once you've, in fact, have all three how you want, you turn the first one down facing up, and flip the other two's back and glue this and bring them over and glue each surface to put them on. If you don't do that, it's real easy to accidentally flip them wrong and get the, an upper curve on the lower curve and they don't match up so good. It's, you can still do the job. It just totally increases the amount of work that you're going to have. So uh, I'll start this and then... Uh, Hands don't work so good anymore. Alright, so there we go. So I'm just going to take and pour this on here. You can buy a small bottle. You don't have to have this big one, but I've been building a lot of bow forms lately, so it's worth having. So anyway, I'm just going to take this, spread the glue down nicely. It's a fairly fast set time, so you can dawdle on this job. You don't want it setting before it's screwed together. So that gives you about 20 minutes to do your job. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this up on edge and press everything down. And you can see my quarter inch board is a little bit taller. And I want the curves as close as possible so that uh, it's easier to, in fact, uh, do the routing. All right, so standing up, I'm going to just go ahead and put uh, a couple deck screws to hold this in place. But always, the holder, holders, you're going to put two in the center because you don't want, if you put screws at the ends, you're going to have a gap in the middle you can't pull together. We put one in the middle and one in here, pulled it together, that kept it from shifting so I could shift it over and put screws in to pull it together now. The important thing here is to get the top to pull together. We're going to work from the middle out and bury them in because the router is going to have to glide on that edge. If you're going to bury screws in here, you need a good battery. So. Anyway, put them about every three inches. Alright, so anyway, we're going to go down the recurves parts first. Flip it over, do the recurves on the other side. 
near the curves and then fill in spacers along here to in fact uh, pull it all together. Never understood why Americans are so opposed to using square heads or what we call Roberts. Robertson's screws. They are just the best. You can see the glue squeezing out because it's a good glue seam. So there's no sense you watching me do all this. It's just a bunch of screwing around. We're going to wipe the bottom down. You know, just, just to make it easier later. Hard glue is a lot harder to clean up than wet glue. So we're just going to wipe it all off. And glue is also hard on router bits and sanders and stuff like that. So it's better to get the bulk of the glue off while you can. Okay, there you can see the amount of glue that was squeezed out using the screws as clamps. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and finish wiping the glue up. And there that form is mostly made. So you can see that, you know, experimenting is fun and it doesn't take a lot of time. You can engineer just about anything you want. I mean, we've spent maybe... Well, not an hour yet, because I had an hour of film in that camera, and we're still running on it. Have some fun with these building bows. You have a form, say, Russell, I gave one to you, or Ryan, or anybody for that matter. Uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have some fun and try doing some of your own design ideas. For example, something I've wanted to build for a long time I never got around to is a short bow with a reverse handle coming in here so I can in fact shoot a short short arrow. Wouldn't it be cool to shoot a small short arrow, say a 24 inch draw, taking six inches off the draw to hunt with so that uh, you pick up a lot, of pa a lot of arrow speed, you know, because it's a lot lighter. Now, of course, we've talked about that before. You know, arrow speed is not everything. It's nice, but you can kill a deer with a bow that shoots 120 feet to 140 feet a second. I've not built a bow that shoots that slow, but long bows and some of the short stick bows and things, they're pretty slow, and you can still kill a deer with them, no problem. So have some fun and experiment. Now, I'm going to fold this paper up here and then lay this down on the folded side of the paper so I can glue over my workbench. This is a Rubo style workbench that I built myself. It weighs about 300 pounds. You can see it. You can't, hard, you can't virtually move it. I can't drag it with the weight in it. So once it's in spot, it just kind of stays there. Worth having. Uh, the leg vise, I'll show you the leg vise when we start working on bows, is a great thing to build on your workbench. It's just awesome for bow work and just about any kind of woodwork at all. It's one of my favorites. I'm going to clean this up and get set up to show you how to set up the template with the now completed bow form. Not completed, roughed bow form. So that uh, we can make it so it will actually be perfect to build a bow. As you can see, I've set on top of the glued together bow form. Now it's important that when you lay your template on here that you can see an edge from the form because what's going to happen is the router is going to follow this, the, this edge on top and cut out everything underneath it. Okay? We've lined this up we have this pretty much how we want it so that we can in fact route it exactly in there without any nuances. Or You might have two of the three laminations routed and notice that one's in further in because it wasn't flush out as far as the others. So we adjust the template to make sure we make a complete cut through the entire form. So now once you've done that, you just want to put enough in here to hold it in place so the template doesn't move. Two should do it, and plus hold it down flat. You don't want any uh, cavities. That's why I always work center out. Now, there are two ways to do this. We can do it with a bottom bit or a top bit. On this piece here, we've only got a couple screws to get in the way of the router, so I'm thinking we're gonna go with the bearing on the top. I'll have to check and see. 
I have this new bit and what we're going to do is we're going to use it. We're just dying to use it. Maybe we should do it with the bearing on the bottom. Now I can have the, this down on the bottom and uh, leave this on my table and have it clamped to the table. All right, it's a pretty big bit. Uh, if you don't have a single bit, then what you have to do is use a double bit. You do one side, then you flip it over and go with the bearing on the other end of the bit. Again, back to how I said, you use follow the template, flip the whole form over upside down, and then flip, put this in the router with the bearing down like that, go against the part that's already been routed, and take it off and that would give you a square form, you know, 90 degrees, perfectly smooth. But today we're, I'm going with this new bit, so hold on while I get set up. All right, I, there's my router set up, and if you look here, I've got that bit set up. So I have the bearing on the top. Some people call that the bottom, wherever you want. I'll have it up at the top when it's upside down, bottom when it's the other way around. So. Anyway, I've done that, so, and I put my template down, so that bearing is going to rub on the template, and the cutter part is going to, in fact, do the cutting for us. So, I've also gone and uh, clamped the form and the template down. You can see that right there. So, it's clamped at both ends so it doesn't move, and the clamps are set so they're out of the way, so it doesn't hit your... Uh, router because you don't want to be bumping into things with your router two things you can do you can go without cramming the bearing up to the side and just take a light cut following it keeping the router flat do not let the router tilt you have to keep it flat and half the router is going to be on the the template on the form the other half is going to be over the air so you have to keep your pressure down on the template or the router will lean and then your form will be crooked all right, I'm half deaf already, so I can't afford to lose any more hearing than I already have, so on go the earmuffs. Double check. The router bit turns this way, so I want to pull the router into the form. If I go the other way, it's going to want to launch off. And so now we're going to go ahead and go and we're going to route. It's real important, as I said, not to tilt. I want to show you how nice and smooth that is now. If you look at the curves, absolutely perfect exactly the same as the template okay so you can see how easy that was using the larger single bit to order that bit through white side is 42 bucks and it's worth every penny of it we're going to take this form out pop off the template and then we'll have another look at it all right there's our template off All right, so there you go. That form is almost ready. If I'm going to build and going to uh, make my bow using wraps, you know, the rubber wraps to pull it all together and clamp it, then I'll have to put holes in here. One here, one here, 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 three in the middle. One, two, three to clamp the riser, and then down the other side. So when you're wrapping with the elastics, you can change directions. Apply force from both directions to keep the force equal. We're done for now. Ah, get rid of these. Don't need them. Uh, after inspecting the bow a bit, 
Um, I obviously I had leaned ever so slightly and put a little bit of a dip in the limb. Um, you know, nothing's ever perfect, and I guess the real talent comes not from doing things perfect because we just can't do that. Um, besides, who wants to rival God anyway? So, anyhow, uh, the real challenge is learning how to deal with flaws because everything comes flawed. People too for that matter. Anyhow, uh, so I went back to the drum sander and I just did a little bit of tiniest bit of work on the drum sander and then this was finished. So this form is actually ready to bed. I don't like this little edge where this one was a quarter inch wider than the others. I didn't want to set up the whole table saw and get all done to cut a quarter inch off. But you know, there are ways to always conquer every problem. And that's always the fun part is sorting those things out. One of my all time favorite saws, a Dazuki or a Ryobi saw, Japanese, very aggressive. Don't cut towards yourself, I gave myself 17 stitches doing just that, except it was into my leg. And then we'll just take a plane to that. Just cut away from the body. Probably a better idea. Just take the block plane here. Go down, see if we need the block plane the other end of it. No, that's did a better job with the saw there. This bow form is ready to bed. We're gonna bed this now and I use just a spray adhesive. I use 3M. I've tried other brands and they just don't seem to work very well. So this one, I think all spray adhesives are a pain in the butt, but that's the easiest way around the job. I suppose you could use contact cement and that'd be all right. But the problem is, is the bedding material, that drafting board rubber stuff that I was telling you about, the contact cement doesn't adhere to it for anything, so that's a pain. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to spray this, but I'm going to put this board back here so when I spray, I don't get a lot of overspray onto my other tools and stuff. Here we go. I like to put one edge flush so I only have to trim one edge off. All right. As flush as you can at least. Trim that and well when all else fails, use scissors. Sometimes the curves don't want to stick so well because you actually got the top glued on before the curves. So you go back and check that, pull it up, and readhese it. Yeah, I did that on this one too. And if it's a little bit short on the end here, it's not a big deal because the uh, the bow form is actually taller than the actual length of the bow. And there we go. Now this one is all bedded. Now if I can find the razor blade, I will go along. I got some on the top surface, not going to matter because we're going to put glue on it. But that M77 stuff works really well. I'm pretty darn pleased with it. Just as simple as that. Now, any nuances in here, if you got a little tiny dip or ridge or whatever, when this bow all clamps down, this bedding material is going to absorb some of those discrepancies and make the bow limb smoother and things like that. It's just a smart plan to do. And especially when you're building bows with a curved face on the handle, you have to sand that face to fit the curve exactly. And we're going to do a tape, a whole another tape on, or disc, what do you call it, on just making jigs. Uh, because 
in the world of fine woodwork, being able to build jigs is what makes things precise, makes them fit properly, makes them nice. And of course, the better your jigs, the better your work comes out. And that goes for almost everything. So anyway, we're going to spend some time on that. All right, I found my trusty razor blade. And actually for this particular job, these little razors right here that you use to go in those handheld things, I want to use that. I don't want them with the handle on them. I want to be able to just control this. All right, it's not sharp on the back side. You can apply pressure. And what happens is I take this and I come into the edge. I'm going to take this razor and I'm going to press it up against the wood and just slide it on. You need a new one for this, not some old one. And by keeping it flat on the wood, it's going to cut the rubber mostly the same width as the wood. You can see you're getting these little tiny shavings off and now it's flush on the side. I trim the edges down with the razor blade and now it's time to tape and this is to protect it from glue and stuff. So I'm just going to lay this on here. This is tuck tape. It's used in housing projects, readily available anywhere. And I'll overlap it. It's okay to do that. It's so thin, it doesn't affect anything. And once the bow is in there, it's tightened up and it's compressed down, it's pretty much all just kind of level. So what we need to do now is we come up here, put a slice there. Because it's curved, it's not going to lay down real nice. So we just put some cuts in there. All right. See that? It goes down and then these just pull in on the side. Okay, there's one side done. If you have a piece tear or whatever, it's okay with this thin tape to just to lay a little piece on there and brush it on there. Because as I said, when it all gets said and done, it'll all be so flush and flat it's a joke. And sometimes in the curves, you can tear it or something. put little slits down the way to roll it over. I used to use duct tape. And this is tuck tape. So I'm just going to rub my hand down there. Get everything snugged up. If you're real concerned, you could even put some down the side of your form to protect your form. I always go and wrap my form in cellophane anyway so that it doesn't get wrecked by too much glue coming up the sides. Now this bow form is just about ready as far as itself goes. I could build a bow on here right now just using my wrapping method with old um, tractor tire tubes cut into inch and a half wide strips and you cut them spiral around the tube. I went to a tire place and they get blowouts in their tractor tubes and throw them out throw some to the rubber recycle. If you have a recycled rubber place you can talk to them and maybe get one too. I just have some large scissors. This good ones all right not cheap scissors because you'll just kill your hands and my hands are messed up anyway so you just start in here go in about an inch and a half and you're just going to set here and just work your way doing spirals around the tube till you have about a 20 foot elastic and that's what i use to wrap my uh, bows with and i like that method i like being physically involved uh, this particular bow I'm probably going to build a pneumatic press for just so I can show you how that's done too. If I'm just going to whip one up here, I'll just wrap it up myself real quick. We have to make a jig for making handles to fit this bow. And so I guess the next tape after this will be to uh, how to make a riser jig for sanding. Okay, and everything it takes to do that. And again, you don't have to make jigs. You can draw a line cut of the bandsaw and work ever so slowly at your drum sander until you get it where you can put it down onto the form and not see gaps of light between the form and the handle. It takes hours and hours. I can build a jig probably in an hour, hour and a half max. I use the bow form itself as the template 
to make the jig with that router like I showed you same idea we have the bow template right so what we're gonna do is we use lay that down on a piece of wood and we'll cut it out to fit and then that's gonna be our template to go to the sander to sand it identical every time so I believe I already showed you doing that in the past on some of the other bow building tape I'm not sure the order this piece is going to go in when I'm finished, so that might be after this. <laughs>